Hey folks, Tyler Edlin here, artist and instructor. Now, between my classes at CGMA, the Brush Sauce Academy mentorships, to the monthly community critiques, and more recently my patrons, I go over a lot of student work each and every month. And today I want to show a little exercise that can help strengthen some of your compositional and design skills. This one specifically is going to focus on spatial depth, movement, and lines. It's great for all skill levels, requires not a lot of time, and it can be done traditionally or digitally. So let's take a look. So before I jump into the thick of it, I just wanted to give a brief little overview here with an example from uh, pre the previous month. Again, this is the, the shot or the virtual plein air side of it. You just grab a reference photo. It, it can be from Google Earth. It could be from Map Crunch. It could be one that you take yourself uh, to something mundane. Now what you'll see here from most uh, student cases is that they just draw shapes. They, they understand they need to make good shapes, that they want to have a focal area, that they should have foreground, middle ground, and backgrounds. But sometimes a lot of these things end up being too forced. And what we get is just a series of shapes that feel disconnected and that aren't working together. Like in this example here, we have elements like barns and houses. We have these crop patches. We have a path. But none of these elements are working together yet. So often in my revisions and on composition, I'll try to create rhythms and flows that take the viewer's eye to somewhere more meaningful and impactful from within the shots. So as a brief reminder of some of these things, one principle or aspect of art and design that I'm going to talk about a lot is just maximizing our overlaps. As you could see in the example on the left here, if we have all the elements in the scene, we have some ruins, we have ground planes, we have a background and in a cloud. But it's not very visually interesting and it has a very flat spatial depth because nothing is overlapping and everything's just kind of standing or placed awkwardly in, in their own sort of space. Now, if we take a lot of the core ideas here, uh, you know, paths, ground planes, backgrounds, clouds, ruins, we start overlapping them in dynamic ways, you know, adjusting their scale, we can create something that's a lot more visually appealing, at least to most of us. And so a, a great way to practice and break this part of design down, which is just patterns and rhythms. This exercise I'm talking about today is actually putting all these elements into practice and into play. But a great way that Martin DeChambeau does it here is if you're taking a piece of photo reference, try to literally break it down all its shapes and core components. So in this scene, we have, you know, mountains, the symbol for mountains in this case is triangles. We have hills, which are flattened ellipses. We have trees, which are bowed out ellipses. And it's how we arrange these, how we compose these to have certain beats and rhythms. And again, maximizing the overlaps that we just talked about, you can really create something visually pleasing and appealing. And the problem that a lot of students have is that lack of rhythm, like a, like a music student. they When they're just starting to learn an instrument, it's hard to kind of you know, learn the language of art or learn the language of music and then put it right into play. And that's what we need to do here. We need to see what is the visual language of art and design and how can we arrange them in pleasing ways. That's all this is. And so just to recap all of that so we're on the same page, this exercise will train the following, rhythm and depth. So again, gesture flow creates movement. Let's think about what ultimately a scene is about. That's what the focal point is. And we're going to maximize our shapes. We're going to contrast shapes. We're going to have round shapes. We're going to have hard shapes. And we're going to go big and small shapes. And we can think of scenes as foregrounds, midgrounds, and backgrounds, though they don't have to always have those three elements. That's not a rule or an absolute. All right, so I want to run through, again, a few ways how to approach this. So this is a, taking into account we've gone over and we understand all of the um, principles that we talked about, the basic construction of setting up a space for drawing. So like I mentioned prior, I'm just dropping in a horizon line. So I'm dropping in a horizon line because I do want to make this scene all about that curve, all about that general store. And so I'm just kind of roughing out the perspective. I'm just guessing it at this stage, kind of bringing the lines all the way to that point. Now, what I'm doing here differently 
from the reference photo is I'm trying to tell a slightly different narrative. I'm weaving a different story. I want to make it about some kind of deal that's going down or maybe some sort of slight alteration. So I'm lowering the camera angle or I'm lowering the horizon line to give us a little bit more of that boots on the ground camera view. Now I dropped in a telephone bowl there strategically as it's like one giant kind of uh, you know, flagpole or it's, it's a marker. I'm framing those characters on the corner there. And so see, I'm kind of highlighting that here in uh, these pink arrows. So that's kind of setting up the basic construction of this as we know it. Now I can add additional elements that we see hints of something like a crosswalk. Again, it adds a nice pattern or it adds a nice sense of design leading right to those characters on the curve, of course, which I'm just implying with uh, stick figures. Now, the other thing I can do here, I noticed a lot of curb clutter. I could add that in as, as long as it doesn't become distracting. Remember, a good design or a good composition is just as much about what to take out as it is what to leave in. But I, I don't think this is a problem or overly impacting the scene at this point. Now I'm dropping in a little bit more of those buildings that we're, we're seeing in the uh, background there, the other side of the street. I think that's a fundamental part of this scene. Of course that's like a little bit too low. It's making a bit of a tangent with the roof of our current store. So I'm going to change all that um, on the revision. But I'm adding, you know, some uh, what we talked about earlier. I'm breaking the trees down to simple shapes of ellipses. It, it, it's a nice way for me to gauge the sense of movement. Again, the overlaps, there's a lot of overlapping of shape here. And of course, with the overlapping, that will reinforce our depth. Now, I'm realizing I can add in another sort of line. And a lot of the ratio I like to do is either two thirds in one direction from one side to the other. It's always a great marker. And it also is another method of attaining the rule of thirds. Again, a nice principle that usually works. So if the focal points here, what I can do is use the sign element that's on top of that store as yet another element to add a sense of rhythm and movement to my lines and flow, you know, as I'll highlight uh, momentarily. But yeah, I think this would be a good breakdown. I have a negative shape there, uh, a small shape and one larger negative shape for the negative space. So I, again, I'm always emphasizing the big, the medium, and the small. And that goes with both the positive and the negative space in a scene. I think that kind of sets it up and frames it very well. Now, uh, optionally, of course, I could, you know, reinforce a few other elements. And we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, I just like how a lot of the shapes and movements are always kind of framing our core subject matter. And that's the weakest part about any of these uh, comps that I generally see from a student is it, it's just not sure what it wants to do. It, it lacks that clarification. Like I could add in another meter sign or another street sign right here. Again, it helps frame the objects a little bit more. I could add additionally like a car parked in the road or coming down the road. It's not going to hinder the composition. It will add overlapping. It's one of those things that I literally could go either way with, assuming I could actually draw this car right, which in this case it looks kind of fugly looking, but uh, we'll just leave it like that. But again, it's all about the framing of that one central uh, element and component and how I can do that with the di different rhythms and beats of our visual design language. And so yeah, this is what it would look like if I would uh, keep going with them and keep exploring. So if you apply different restraints and try to tell different stories from a singular base, there's an infinite number of possible expressions and designs you can come up with. So a this is a great exercise that I use, you know, every week to some degree or another. So like an advanced form of this for those seeking a, a real challenge, uh, I would grab for example, this week, a photo of a fish. And it, it's just a free pick online that I grab. It's watermarked and everything. But I try to tell a story with that. So this is a work in progress of a little scene I'm whipping up based off that. So I'm just calling it that first morning catch. And I'm going to load the place up. I'm going to finish painting it. But it's all just from one reference photo. And I'm trying to put my own stamp on it. It's my interpretation of it. And that's how you can treat an exercise like this. It's your interpretation of a scene of a subject. So if you want to challenge yourself and just set up a list of shots that you can try to hit per picture, think of it like this. You could do a wide shot, you could do a narrow shot. 
You can include something like scale comparison, have something large versus something small in your scene. You could do something entirely random and just break the, the rule. So in this case, I'm just dropping a scene in the center. I'm not gonna overlap much, but it certainly empowers it. You could always mess with depth, perspective. We can use that depth and perspective, of course, to keep framing our subjects. What if we change the horizon line? What if we have a shot that's so far up that the uh, horizon line is well below the the uh, picture plane or well above the picture lane and we're looking down into it. Of course these are different forms of up shots and down shots. We could do something close up like in our corner scene today. What if we just zoomed in on the character's snarky face holding up his gun? He's gonna hold somebody up. And of course we can always balance the negative and the positive. So guys look how my student Arnie has been putting all this feedback into consideration for his shots. He could tell drastically different stories using the same piece of photo reference. It's low time commitment. It's non-committal. You don't get attached to this so you can just focus on design and he's really pushing these. Of course if you want to amp up the challenge and in and itself is a different exercise which will warrant a different video but add value to your shots. Can you tell your story with one or two values? If that's too challenging, can you do that with three? There's not a right or wrong way to address this. There's not a right or wrong composition. It's all about what composition is best for your story, what is best for your focal point, which at the end of the day is what your image is about. So guys, what is your image about? Hey everyone, for this month's shoutouts, I wanted to give a special shoutout to my former student Bakari here. He wrote me an email this week and he said, I took your fundamentals of design class about a year ago and it was my first introduction to design and it was eye-opening because of you and it sent him out on a quest for a greater understanding. Uh, and it says, I set out to water the seeds you had planted and they slowly grew on their own. And the way you describe the design process is sunk in and now I know what you meant. The battle of an illustration doesn't start at the canvas or even the strike of inspiration. I, I found ways to deliberately set out and create something from basic simple ideas. Also, he says, and I'd like to include your new tutorial series on your store is amazing as well. And I'm starting to appreciate the skill teachers like you have and are more than just flashy tutorials. You have a skill of breaking down concepts and you're able to relate to students in an organized well to help guide them. And he wants to thank me once more just for uh, helping him set off on his professional path. Well, thank you, Bakari. I definitely appreciate that. And I, these messages help me get through the longer weeks. And again, guys, you can go visit Bakari here if you like his art. Uh, he, he's got an art station. I'll, of course, have a link below in the description. And my second shout out is going to come directly from my patron. I, I thank everybody for your support. If you find yourself struggling with fundamentals, you need art help, you need critiques and feedback, you need some kind of structure like in today's video, definitely check it out. There's everything from behind the scenes interviews to full length tutorials on color and light. I post job postings in here. It's got a little bit of everything to help you with your art and design needs. So today we're gonna give a special shout out to David Matesi. Sorry, if, David, if I pronounce your name wrong, but I've been following David's work for a while. We've been in contact. He's doing great work. You definitely should check it out. And the best part about this is you can literally see the growth in his stuff from like these newer images down to um, these older ones, you know, way, way at the bottom. You could you could see the the growth in how he's approaching his image. It's absolutely doing great. And I think it was somewhere maybe after this one or this one, this is the one I, I really can start to see a lot of change and in, in sophistication in his designs and really cool, really imaginative, really colorful work. Definitely go check his stuff out at uh, davidmateshi.com. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, uh, definitely leave them below. If there's topics you would want to see me cover in future videos, let me know as well. Do take care.